Okay, so how is everyone today? <laughs> Gotta say that because the camera just turned on. <laughs> okay, so today's the uh, 29th. So just to bring us up to speed, the camera up to speed, right? Uh, uh, it was intended that there would be written homework due today, but uh, due to technical issues, uh, that didn't happen. Uh, but uh, I believe all the technical issues are, are, are figured out. So uh, I'll post some homeworks uh, tonight, uh, and they'll be due on Thursday. Most of them will be easy. I, trust me, I am cognizant that uh, that's two days. Okay, but uh, we'll, we'll make sure it works, yeah? Will those be put in the e-learning or the box? The box thingy. Okay. And I'll send messages, uh, a message that says, you know, click here and then log in yeah. here and then click oh, that. Found it. Okay, good. Yeah. So you're going to post those this tonight. Thursday tonight. Right. Okay. Yeah, two of them are going to be just uh, you just print it out and uh, put your name on it, and then uh, that's it. Okay. So like, not hard. Okay. <laughs> but uh, some of them uh, will have an actual question. Okay. But uh, it won't be like a big, big. I promise, I'm not going to slam you for two days. Uh, other questions? Okay. Good. So uh, last time we were talking about uh, um, antiderivatives. Okay, so then uh, we're still there in uh, section 7.1, antiderivatives. And uh, I'm going to, you know, re restate a couple of those things because I think it's a good strategy to, you know, to just for five minutes or so you know, cover what you did last time. Uh, also, I want to say it uh, in a little different way, so maybe you can see it from a different point of view. Uh, so here's the thing, uh, a thing. In, uh, you know, in class, I'm, I usually don't uh, write that, 13x. What I mean specifically is I, uh, I usually write the, the implied punctuation uh, in there. What I mean to say is that uh, I write this, 13, and then the dot, and then the x. Uh, the dot is implied, uh, but it's, uh, it's there. Uh, so uh, what I want to remind you of, or just inform you if you didn't already know, is that uh, here we have, uh, you know, when you write the 13 next to the x, that's understood to mean 13 multiply x. Uh, when you write the x there, but uh, then a 2 in superscript position, then that, that's understood to mean an exponent. So, but uh, just like there's an implied punctuation missing uh, for that one, uh, there's implied punctuation for this one. What's the punctuation for exponent? Yeah, that one. The pointy one. Yeah. Carrot. Uh, so... Uh, you write it uh, with punctuation like this, x caret 2. Just an interesting thing. Uh, so like if you wanted an exponent 4, you'd write caret 4. Uh, that's how you uh, accomplish, say, like, uh, you know, 13 to exponent 4 uh, in the calculator. Right, it's 13 and then caret 4. That's how you get it, uh, you know, get the job done there. So, uh, that, that being said, uh, let's imagine that we have the following machine, the, the squaring machine. Uh, that is to say that uh, the input is x, it goes to the squaring machine, the way you write that is uh, like that, caret 2. Uh, and then what comes out is, uh, well, x squared. Now here's the thing about the squaring machine. Uh, in some ways pretty pretty easy to understand, but uh, it's not reversible in the following kind of sense. Suppose that uh, you witness a 16 as output, that uh, the output of the machine is 16. Uh, do you know what the input was? What could have the input been? Could have been 4. Is that the only conceivable input? Uh, negative 4 would work too, right? So uh, if you witness a 16 come out, um, you can't be for sure uh, whether or not it was a 4 that was input 
or a negative 4 that was input. You can't, you can't uh, be sure of that. Uh, the way that you can, you know, from college algebra, the way that uh, you can see that visually in a different way is that if you were to look at a plot of uh, y is x squared, then uh, it looks like this. <clears throat> Uh, if you put a horizontal line up here at uh, y is 16, then how many times does that uh, green line intersect the red? Twice, right? Uh, what it's saying is that, uh, well, this input of 4 could have produced the output 16, and uh, this input of negative 4 also could have produced the output of 16. So now, if we uh, if we surgery this this red and we cut away the left side, uh, leaving the origin, so we leave the point at the origin, but but, but we surgery away all the stuff on uh, on the left side, then there'd only be one intersection, uh, and that in such a in that case the machine would be reversible. What's the name for the reversed squaring machine? Square root. The reverse squaring machine is square root, right? The one that undoes it. So that is to say, uh, you know, it's uh, it's uh, no punctuation. You know, is that radical symbol there? Uh, so you do this, uh, like so. So out comes square root x. It's what happens when you take uh, just the right side of the parabola and give it a twist and lay it on its side. So the squaring and the square root functions are, in a sense, uh, they, uh, they undo each other uh, in the following kind of sense. Uh, if, uh, I'll say it like this, for x is greater than or equal to 0, so that is, that is to say on this picture if we're on the right side, then if you take an x and you give it to the squaring machine, and watch x squared come out. And then you wire up that output as the input to the square root machine. Then what comes out? X. <laughs> right? So what I want you to see is that uh, all this right here, you know, this whole thing is like a complicated way to do nothing. <laughs> right? Uh, you know, <laughs> do all that stuff with the, with the x, and then, uh, well, that, that amounts to having done nothing with the x. Uh, similarly, you can do it in the other order. <clears throat> so now, the reason why I'm uh, bringing this up uh, is I want you to kind of have the sense that uh, the squaring is like a, a thing you could do, and square root is another thing uh, you could do, and these two things undo each other. Uh, but if you... Uh, they only undo each other if you restrict yourself to x greater than or equal to zero. Because uh, otherwise we'd run into the problem that we're not real sure if we, if we witness, say, 100 come out of the squaring machine, we don't know if it was 10 which was put in or negative 10. Okay. Now, uh, to a large, <laughs> to, to a rough approximation, uh, the, the, the math sequence, calculus one and calculus two, uh, is the study of a pair, just like, uh, just like squaring and square root are a pair that uh, sort of undo each other. Um, calculus one and two are the study of a pair of such things that undo each other, derivative and antiderivative. So calculus one uh, primarily is the study of derivative and uh, what that's all about, and uh, calculus two uh, at least begins with a study of antiderivative and what and what that's all about. Uh, so what I mean to say uh, is that uh, you know we've got uh, for derivatives you know you can give f to the derivative machine, and then out comes I'll just denote it as f prime and uh, 
you know, we could also have the antiderivative machine. So f, we give it to uh, the antiderivative machine. Out comes big F. Uh, so what I'm telling you is that, uh, <clears throat> in some sense, that uh, if we give F first, I'll say, to the antiderivative machine, and then watch big F come out, and then we follow that up with the derivative machine, what comes out the right side? Little f. <laughs> That's altogether a complicated way to say, I want you to do nothing. <laughs> OK. <clears throat> Good. So now let's, uh, what I'm kind of telling you is that uh, we've calculus one focused on this part of the machine. And uh, now we're going to focus on uh, that part of the machine for a little bit. OK. So to sort of remind you, because we did a couple examples of antiderivative last time, I'll remind you, bring us back into that. So uh, suppose I ask you about uh, this. So what's being asked, that's, that's a dx, that's what that says. <coughs> What's being asked here is that uh, it's a way to ask this question. Suppose that uh, we write that I wrote this, and I'm saying, I'm asking you, what goes in the box? What, uh, what could you differentiate so that the result would be 5 times x to 4? Right. So uh, x to the fifth. So that's part of it because, after all, uh, according to the power rule, if you differentiate x to 5, it's 5x to 4. Uh, but you'd get 5x to 4 uh, if you took x to fifth plus any constant whatsoever. Uh, so the way that uh, you signify your knowledge of that is by writing plus c. So now, uh, the reason why I said the squaring, one of the reasons I said the squaring and square root thing is that, uh, well, for the squaring machine, if you witness 81 come out, you don't know if 9 was put in or negative 9. You can't be sure. What I'm telling you is that uh, for, it, for the derivative machine, if you witness 5x to 4 come out, did it have to be x to 5? No, it could have been x to 5 plus uh, 8. That would, that, that would have been, that would have worked. Or x to 5 plus 8 million, for that matter. Okay, so you can't know uh, precisely what the input was. That's what the meaning of the plus c is. Good. Any question about that? <coughs> OK. So now, uh, for all of the, for every derivative rule, we have a corresponding antiderivative anti-rule. So, uh, to be clear, we have something called uh, the power rule. Now, the power rule for derivatives says that uh, the derivative of x to exponent n, uh, and uh, this is going to be true for any exponent that's not 0, right? Uh, this rule does not. Uh, it does not hold when n is 0. Uh, what's the rule? Uh -huh. n times x. Well, we're, th this is for a derivative. Oh, for a derivative. For a derivative. Yeah, like this. Okay, so that's a, you know, that's the that's a rule that you've known for a semester at least. Uh, okay, so now what I want you to uh, see 
is that uh, there's two things that are occurring, is you're taking this expression and turning it into that expression, and two things occur, and they occur in uh, an order. So uh, the, the things that occur is that, uh, you know, sort of like 1.1, 1 .1, you uh, copy in and uh, multiply and use it as a multiplier, use as a multiplier, and then after you've made your copy of it, uh, the next thing you do is that uh, you subtract uh, 1 from uh, the exponent. So there's two things, and that's the order that they occur in. So the reason why I'm saying uh, it has to be this order is because, well, if you subtracted 1 from the exponent first, then uh, that would be n minus 1, right? So you've got you to make a copy of the exponent first and bring it down and then subtract 1. OK, so antiderivative is, uh, is the opposite of derivative. This is what undoes it. So that means that uh, if we're going to talk about the antiderivative power rule, that means that there's still going to be two things. There's two things are still going to have to occur. Uh, we're going to have to make a copy of something, but uh, we're going to have to do the opposite of this. So instead of using it as a, uh, to multiply, what are we going to use it for? To divide, right? We've got to do the opposite thing. The opposite of multiply is divide. And uh, instead of subtract 1, what are we going to do? Add 1. Uh, so we're going to do the opposite of, 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 of each bit. We're going to do the opposite thing. But moreover, uh, we have to do them in uh, the reverse order, which means that uh, for a derivative, we did this one first. But uh, for antiderivative, we're going to have to do that one first. Right? We have to re do the opposite of things and do them bottom to top. OK. So if we want to do the antiderivative of x to n, then, uh, well, the opposite of subtract 1 from the exponent is add 1. So it'll be x to n plus 1. So we'll be adding 1 to the exponent. Uh, then now we need to make a copy of that exponent and do what with it? Divide. And now, you write plus c to signify that uh, you understand that uh, this result is not unique. Uh, OK, so let's, let's try it out. So uh, well, one more thing needs to be said, is that uh, uh, for, the, for derivatives, the uh, forbidden exponent, the, the exponent for which the power rule does not apply, is uh, 0. Uh, now, for antiderivatives, there is also an n for which, this, uh, d that for which it does not apply, uh, but it's not 0. Uh, what, uh, what n does this formula not apply for? Negative 1. Negative one. So you can see uh, from right here why n equal negative 1 would pose a problem. Because uh, if n were negative 1, then this denominator would be negative 1 plus 1, which is 0. And uh, you can't divide by 0. OK, so good. So the derivative, the power rule from the derivative point of view, the power rule from the antiderivative point of view. All right, let's have an example. So how about uh, antiderivative of, uh, say, mm, x to exponent 8 dx? So this is like a straight application. Well, what will the new exponent be? 9, so x to 9, and then divide by 9, and then add a constant. Any question about this one? Question. Uh -huh. Your tests and quizzes, is that appropriate, or would you prefer one? Either one. Okay. 
it doesn't matter. Uh, okay, so how about uh, how about antiderivative of um, say w to exponent uh, three halves dw. So in the first place, I'm using w just so you don't get too emotionally attached to x, because okay? there's nothing uh, intrinsically uh, special about the name x. It's just a name. Uh, also, I'm putting a fraction in there because I know that there's a high probability that at least a few of you are going to feel uncomfortable with a fraction. So let's get through that now. <laughs> so uh, does a fraction uh, have any bearing on whether or not we're supposed to use the power rule? No. It says uh, any time that, uh, any time that uh, the, uh, what you're anti-differentiating is of the form variable to exponent and moreover that exponent is, is not negative one, then you're supposed to use the power rule. So variable, constant exponent. That constant exponent is not negative one. So we're supposed to use the power rule. So, uh, you know, you could write this as w to 3 halves plus 1 over 3 halves plus 1 plus a constant. And then uh, that probably uh, bears a little bit of simplification. So 3 halves plus 1, well, 1 is 2 halves. So 3 halves plus 2 halves is 5 halves. And uh, I'm just going to leave it uh, like that uh, so that it looks, the connection to the fact that we use the power rule is clear. Uh, now, that being said, uh, sometimes you want to make some algebraic simplifications or sometimes uh, you might want to understand why does the homework server say that uh, this, the answer to this practice exercise is that. Well, one simplification that uh, you could do here is that instead of dividing by a fraction, you can do what? You can multiply by its reciprocal, right? You flip it, you know what I'm saying? So instead of dividing by 5 halves, you can multiply by 2 fifths. So uh, I imagine that uh, the homework server, if you were to do like a practice exercise on it, it would probably represent the answer as 2 fifths uh, w to 5 halves or something like that. Let's see. But uh, I'm just fine with you stopping right there. Any questions about this one? Okay. Uh, what about what about uh, antiderivative of a to exponent um, say 1.7 dA? So it's uh, a, the new exponent is 2.7, uh, and then divide by 2.7, and then plus the constant. Nothing surprising. Or maybe the surprise is that it's so unsurprising. Uh, how, about, uh, how about the antiderivative of, um, uh, how about, uh, yeah, how about x to exponent, um, 3 uh, divided by x to exponent 8 dx. So I'm going to make a I'm going to make a mistake. 
So if you're going to copy down what I'm about to write, then uh, please also carefully note that it's not right. Uh, so here we go. Uh, I think it ought to be uh, x to exponent 4 over 4, and then that divided by uh, x to exponent 9 over 9, plus a constant. That sounds good. Seems reasonable. What do you think? Nah. <laughs> That's not right. So now, uh, here's the thing. I see this kind of answer all of the time uh, when I teach uh, this, this, kind of, uh, this kind of course. Uh, I imagine what happens inside of students' head is that uh, they see like, uh, well, if it was just that, if it was just x to 3, then uh, I know I'd do that. And if it was, if it was just x to 8, uh, I know I'd do that. So maybe I'll hope beyond hope and just uh, sort of do that in the numerator and the denominator. OK. So it's not right. Now, we're asking about uh, the antiderivative of the quotient of two functions, one function uh, that is the cubing function and one function that is the caret 8 function, the function which raises to exponent 8, uh, the quotient of these. Right? So now, uh, and remember that antiderivative is the opposite of derivative. It is the inverse of it, in a sense. And uh, the, uh, the action that the derivative does with quotient is so notable that there's literally something called the quotient rule. Right? That's the one where you compute the derivative of both functions, and then you do some thingy in the numerator, and then you divide by the square of whatever, and all that craziness. That's the quotient rule for derivatives. How could it, you know, it, what I want to point out is it's kind of crazy what it's doing. How could it be so simple that antiderivatives would do this? It's not. Okay? So what I'm saying is like, uh, if you understand that antiderivative is the opposite of derivative, then uh, you ought to be, if this, if this was true and it's not, then you uh, should be like flabbergasted. Okay. Now, fine. That's not right. Uh, all right, so um, here's a standard calculus instructor question, is that, uh, so you're taking calculus now, and uh, you, uh, did you take algebra before this, or are you going to take algebra after this? Before this course, right? Yeah, you took it before this course. So uh, how, about, how about we perform all possible algebraic simplifications prior to doing any calculus steps? How about that? So in particular, what I'd like for you to note is that um, some x's can cancel, right? Uh, because there's three of them up here and eight of them down there. Uh, so doing that, mm, what do we get? I can see that there would be five x's left in the denominator. Uh, what do I need to write in the numerator? One, One. right? Because uh, all of the x's were canceled. Okay. So now I'm going to have another error. And again, I just show these errors because uh, I want to show you the, the slippery missteps that you might make. Uh, here's, an, here's, a, here's another thing that I see quite common, is that a uh, student says, uh, okay, uh, that, that looks like the power rule, so it must be, uh, I'll leave that one there, and then x to 6 over 6, like that, and I remember the plus c, because that guy's always talking about that, so there we go. Is that right? No, right? It's sort of, <laughs> I mean, you can kind of see that the, you know, Something like the power rule occurred. But uh, I have a question. In the formula for the power rule for the antiderivative, where's the 1 over in the formula? There isn't one, right? So uh, this, is a, this is a misfire. It's not right. OK. <clears throat> that won't work. Uh, so then, rather, what we need to do is we need to somehow, 
we need to somehow express this uh, in a way that's compatible with that, even if it might mean that perhaps the exponent would be negative. How could we write this so that it looks like x to some exponent n? X to negative five. X to negative five. So now, can you see that uh, now we'll use the, po uh, the power rule for this one, right here, uh, with n is uh, negative 5. So I'll give you a moment to uh, work that out. <coughs> yeah? Can we just to x negative 5? Where? Here? Uh, the next one. This one to that one? Uh, this one to that one? Yeah. Yeah, that'd be fine. But uh, I've got to take us on the detour of all the potholes, right. you know? Uh, because when it comes right down to it and the pressure's on, you know, <laughs> who knows where your path might lead. Uh, but yeah, it would be fine to jump to the negative five. So uh, what's the new exponent? Negative four. But wait. Isn't negative 5 plus 1 negative 6? No, it's negative 4, like you said, right? <laughs> the, re the, reason <laughs> the reason I point this out is that uh, almost uh, without fail, students do 7 plus 1 is 8. No problem. But then they do negative 7 plus 1 is negative 8. It happens. Okay, so just pay attention to that. Negative 4 uh, over negative 4 like this plus C. Good. Any question about this one? Yeah? How often do you see people get questions wrong over little things like that? That is the most common kind. Yeah. These things that I'm, that I'm saying, yeah. It's the most common kind. And then, uh, well, we're going to end up having, you know, uh, in our class, uh, well, there's, it depends on how you count, but uh, sort of, you might say, like, in our class, there's like 10 antiderivative rules that you need to memorize. Uh, that's just our class, but, uh, you know, if you go to the wide world, then there's hundreds and hundreds. Uh, the other major problem is just completely using the wrong rule. But uh, the most common kind of error that I find is algebraic errors. Yes? How much of Today, <laughs> then uh, well, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna do the bulk of it today. Uh, then uh, we're going to go over how to undo the chain rule on Thursday, right? Because today we're gonna go over how to, you know, we're we're this is we're undoing the power rule right now. Uh, we're we're gonna do several others uh, on Thursday. We're gonna undo the chain rule. Uh, then we're gonna go down some rabbit hole that's gonna seem like uh, what are we even talking about? Uh, for a little bit, and then uh, I'll tie, hopefully, tie it all together with a, uh, with a nice bow by the end of next week. Yeah? Um, are you going to do more examples of the function, like ones that are simple with one of Yeah, we're going to do a lot of them. We're going to do antiderivatives all day today. Okay, uh, another one. How about, uh, how about the antiderivative of the square root of z, dz. What do you mean? Very good. So, uh, right. So in some sense, I want you to sort of observe that uh, it, at least for a moment, seems non sequitur that, uh, uh, that I would give you all these examples concerning the power rule and then give you a square root. Uh, but the thing that you have to remember is that uh, square root corresponds to fractional exponent half. So this would be antiderivative of z to exponent 1 half dz 
uh, then this works just like just like it always does uh, with the power rule I mean to say so then uh, you know we're gonna add one to one half one half plus one is three halves so the new exponent is three halves so z to exponent three halves divide by three halves plus a constant any question about this one okay so now uh, here's part of the, the, the deal is that uh, Historically, you know, algebra, um, in, to, in varying degrees, to various extents, extents kind of uh, goes back to antiquity. And it's really old. Um, it's not, I mean, they, they didn't have nearly as good of stuff that we have now, but, but it goes way back. Whereas calculus is relatively, uh, relatively young. You know, like, uh, I think uh, it's going on in third century, more, kind of, more or less. It's not that old uh, compared to algebra. Um, so, the, the situation on the ground is that when you want to do a math exercise, uh, it usually proceeds in phases, where you do, uh, like all of this phase is you do some algebra, and then uh, this part is where you do a few brief calculus steps, and then very often you proceed to do a little bit more algebra, like that's the way it kind of goes. A little bit of algebraic work, punctuated calculus for just a second. Uh, like derivatives and antiderivatives and things like that, and then more algebra. Uh, as a result, uh, we have the following kind of thing. So when you're when you're dealing with um, <coughs> uh, square roots, say something like the square root of x, very often that's the most uh, convenient representation for square roots when you're doing algebra. But uh, when, that is to say, when you're doing steps which are algebraic. But when you're doing steps that are uh, calculus steps, uh, very often uh, the square root is not uh, the best representation. What's a better representation? Like you said, with fractional exponent half. So, like, if you're doing, if you're if you're trying to solve equations, then radicals. Uh, are usually nicer, notationally. Uh, but if you're doing der derivatives and antiderivatives, usually fractional exponent half is nicer. <coughs> okay. Similarly, uh, how about uh, you know something like, like this, fifth root of w. Well, how do we write that in a calculus-friendly way? Yeah. So W with fractional exponent one fifth. <clears throat> All right. Uh, how about uh, how about uh, something like three over z to exponent uh, eight? Now that might be a perfectly reasonable thing to write if uh, if you're trying to deal trying to solve some kind of equation or otherwise perform some algebraic steps. But uh, if you're going to do calculus on su with such a thing, then what would be probably better? Mm -hmm. Very good. So that's going to end up being a, a more useful representation of that expression. What I'm telling you is that uh, these, these are equivalent. These are the same. But, uh, you know, for the purposes of use, usage, uh, more or less, these are usually more amenable to algebra steps uh, and these to calculus steps. And what I'm telling you is that uh, when we start getting uh, comfortable with the antiderivative tool uh, and we start using them like in more... Uh, extended problems like word problems and things like that. You're going to do some algebraic steps, blah, and then switch over to some calculus and blah, and then usually switch back to algebra, blah, down the line. I'm just preparing you for that eventuality. Any questions? Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, so we have uh, 
the constant multiple rule. And for those of you who like to keep track of the mathematician term terminology, this is the homogeneity rule. So for derivatives, suppose we have a function f and some constant uh, c. So we've got some function f and some constant c. And uh, currently, what this is saying, it's saying, OK, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to take that function and that constant, and you're going to multiply them. So you multiply them. And then once you've done that, once you've made that product, then compute the derivative. So multiplication uh, occurs first, and then differentiation occurs next. The rule says that, uh, in fact, you can take that c outside of the derivative, like so. And uh, this representation is saying, OK, this time, first, you're going to compute the derivative. And after you've done that, then multiply by that constant. So we're still doing both things. We're still performing a multiplication by c. And we're still differentiating with respect to x. But uh, what we're saying is that, uh, in fact, it doesn't matter what order you do it in. The result's going to be the same. Uh, the sameness of the result is called, uh, well, it's called the constant multiple rule, or homogeneity. Uh, we talked about that last time. <coughs> Uh, so, in the end, uh, remember that derivative is defined in terms of limit. You know, the limit thingy, the limit is blah, blah, blah. Uh, limit is homogeneous when the limit exists. And uh, derivative, in a, in, a, in a sense, inherits its homogeneity from limit. The fact that uh, limit is homogeneous uh, is what uh, causes, in a sense, uh, the derivative to be homogeneous. Uh, and because antiderivative is really just derivative, it's just saying just turn the machine around, uh, it's also homogeneous going the other way. So, uh, two, it is also the case that uh, now I'm going to, for, for antiderivative, I'm going to make the constant uh, k, but only because I don't want you to, uh, uh, you know, confuse it for what uh, we're usually writing, the plus c thingy. So this is saying that uh, take a function and a constant k and uh, multiply them. And after you've multiplied them, uh, multiplied them, then compute the antiderivative. You can also do it in the other order, which is to say, first thing, compute the antiderivative of that function, and then after you've done that, multiply it. Uh, it doesn't matter what order you do it in. All right. So how about please compute the antiderivative of, uh, say, uh, 13 multiplied by uh, x to 5 dx. So now, because this is the first one, I'll do it. But, uh, and y'all will do the, the next ones. But uh, I want you to see that it's exactly an application of that rule immediately above. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll apply that rule. That rule is saying that, in fact, uh, you can factor out that 13. And obtain that. Uh, now, for that one, we can use the power rule. and in a certain, you know, sort of ignore the 13. Uh, if that's what we were doing, then what would the answer be? Very good. So then if that 13 wasn't there, then the answer would be x to 6 over 6. Uh, but the 13 is there, so we just need to copy it. Let's see. So that's the answer. <clears throat> Uh, does it, that, yeah, just any anything that uh, the, that uh, 
any a reasonable person would interpret to mean that uh, that's that's a constant. So you don't put the I'm not sure I follow your Between question. The, you don't put them, because you see how you kind of separated the 13 out mm -hmm. outside of the mm -hmm. anti derivative. Mm -hmm. You don't put that in the following answer. Oh, I think maybe your question is, uh, should I parenthesize that? Yeah, what, what, what happens to the, or the anti derivative between those two sets? Uh, okay. Uh, how about, uh, then I, I have a question here. How about, uh, what if I do this? So I can get the 5 out because derivative is homogeneous. And then now I can differentiate x to 7. What's the derivative of x to 7? The derivative. 7x to 6. Okay, now I have a question. From here to here, what happened to the derivative symbol? Yeah. It, uh, you know, in, in a sense, that uh, applying the power rule uses it up, okay. you might say. Uh, what I'm saying is that, uh, is that uh, that thing right there between my index fingers will use the power rule for antiderivatives. And uh, the, the answer to the thing between my index fingers is uh, x to 6 over 6 plus a constant. So that's where it uh, went. Okay. <clears throat> Other questions? OK. <clears throat> so now, uh, normally, uh, in fact, when you get uh, comfortable with the homogeneity rule, you usually don't write this one in the middle. Yeah, because once you've done it enough, it's kind of obvious what's happening. Uh, but something uh, intermediate does happen. You can imagine that, uh, you know, the 13 comes out, uh, et cetera. All right. So how about, uh, uh, let's do the next one. So we have uh, the sum rule. And for those of you just uh, that like to know the mathematician lingo, uh, the name for this is additivity. Additivity. Uh, for derivatives, it's saying that, OK, if you have two functions and the operation that you're interested in is adding, then uh, this one is saying, OK, take those two functions, and the first thing you're going to do is you're going to add them. And uh, once you have the result, differentiate the result. So we're doing two things. We're adding and we're differentiating. Uh, but adding is occurring first, and differentiating is occurring last. Uh, the sum rule for derivative says that, uh, well, in fact, you can do it uh, in the other order, too, and it's the same. It's saying that uh, you can differentiate the individual pieces, differentiate f, differentiate g, uh, and then once you've differentiated each individual piece, now add them. So we're still adding, we're still differentiating. Uh, what the rule is saying is that uh, you can do it in whatever your preferred order is. <clears throat> so this is uh, additivity. And again, uh, antiderivative, uh, because it's just turning the machine around, is also additive. Uh, uh, antiderivative is also additive. Uh, it inherits its additivity from the, from the derivative. Uh, so uh, what am I trying to say? Mm, antiderivative of f of x plus g of x dx. So this is saying, uh, take the two functions and add them together first. And uh, once you've done that, then anti-differentiate the result. You could just as well anti-differentiate each individual piece. <clears throat> uh, 
And then once you've uh, anti-differentiated each piece, then add them together. <clears throat> so this one is saying anti-differentiate first, then add. This one is saying add first, then anti-differentiate. The rule is saying that those are the same. <clears throat> All right, let's have an example. <clears throat> how, about, uh, <clears throat> how about this one? Uh, antiderivative of 5w squared minus uh, 8w to exponent 13. Uh, divide this all by 2 multiplied by w to exponent uh, 6 dw. Okay, so this is uh, when you really need to take it to heart, the, the, the joke, heuristic, suggestion thing that says, uh, you know, do your algebraic steps before your calculus steps. So we need to uh, algebraically simplify this as much as possible before we undertake any uh, derivatives or antiderivatives or anything. All right. So the first thing that uh, we're going to do is that uh, you've got to remember that there's an algebra rule that says that a plus b over c, when you have a, a sum or difference of things in the numerator over a single item in the denominator, then you can split it like so. You can say that this is a over c plus b over c. Okay, so that's the first order of business. Uh, this will be antiderivative of 5w squared over 2w to 6, and then uh, subtract 8w to 13 over 2w to 6. DW. Okay, good. Any question about that step? Okay, so now we want to simplify them as much as possible. Uh, for the first term inside of there, uh, I'm going to factor out the coefficient. What I mean is that uh, for this one, I can see that this is 5 halves multiplied by something or other. Uh, so what's the something or other? Um, not quite. So so, but let, let's uh, let's let's see about that. So specifically, uh, here's the rule: is that if you have something that looks like x to m divided by x to n, where you have uh, the same base in the numerator and the denominator, x, or in this case, uh, w, uh, then you can combine them into a, uh, into a single thing uh, by doing something with the exponents. Doing what? Minus. m minus n. So the numerator exponent minus the denominator exponent. So your, your response was not right uh, because, I suspect, uh, you did uh, you did this, m divided by n, 2 over 6. That would be my guess. So it's this one. So what do I need to write here? w to what? Negative 4, good. Uh, w to negative 4. OK, then uh, subtract what? Okay, 4, 8 over 2, yeah. And then multiplied by? W to 7, very good. DW. Notably, uh, we have not done any calculus. Uh, now, we, so I keep writing the antiderivative stuff, 
because that's, you know, that's, that's the signal to yourself and to the greater that, uh, yeah, I'm keeping track of the fact that that has yet to be done. There's still stuff to be done. But uh, nothing has, nothing, no, no calculus stuff has occurred yet. We're just, like, preparing for it. Okay. So now we can finally do it. Uh, because of the homogeneity rule, I can just write, uh, I can just copy that five halves. Okay, then uh, what about this one? Uh huh. W to negative three over negative three. Then minus four. Mm hmm. Over eight. And then plus a constant. Right. And then uh, you know if this was a uh, very often um, later in the course and in real life. If you anti-differentiate something, it's not, uh, you don't just stop there. Like, now that you have that thing, now you need to do something with it, right? But uh, if that were the case, if we were to want to, if we wanted to go on and do something with this, then, you know, you might cancel the, you know, the 4 over 8 to become half and things like that. But, uh, you know, we're not going to do anything with it here yet. Any question about this one? <clears throat> This is okay. <clears throat> so we've got, uh, you know, derivatives have a homogeneity rule, and uh, so do antiderivatives. Derivatives have an additivity rule, so do uh, antiderivatives. Uh, good. So let's do uh, one more <clears throat> before we move on to the next rule. Um, how about the antiderivative of uh, about 4 <coughs> uh, t squared plus 2 t uh, minus 8 dt. Okay, so uh, let's see if we can do just a, uh, some of them look kind of easy. So I'm going to see if I can just do some of them just immediately. Like maybe we can, uh, for this one, maybe we can anti-differentiate that one immediately. So what, what do you get? Over three, good. Okay, then plus, that one's pretty easy. What's that one? 2t squared over t, okay. Uh, two, sorry, 2t two squared over 2. Uh, then uh, I'll write minus antiderivative of 8 dt, just to, you know, because i got to think about that one for a second. So I did a little bit of work, and then, uh, you know, maybe you paused there and thought, oh, you know, I don't know, i got to think about it. So, uh, Part of this is that uh, this is the first time that we've anti-differentiated a constant. So, you know, let's, let's pause and think about that for a second. But also, I want to point out that uh, notice that uh, we performed some of the anti-differentiation, but not all of it. Uh, so, here's the thing. Are we supposed to write the plus C here or not, or what? Okay, the answer actually is no. Uh, at, at this place, yeah, at this place. Uh, so, so not here, not on this step, we don't write the plus C, because there's yet more uh, anti-differentiation to occur. So there's still, still, uh, still stuff. So we don't write the plus C yet. Now, 
uh, ignoring the rest of that stuff for a moment, uh, could you tell me, right, uh, what is the antiderivative of 8? Eight? 8t. Eight but wait a second, I thought, I thought that the antiderivative of a constant is 0. Ah, right, the derivative of a constant is 0. Right? The derivative of a constant is 0. So I bring this up because uh, all the time I see students uh, more or less do something, you know, they do these just fine, which are arguably more complicated, arguably more difficult. And then uh, anti-differentiate a constant and then uh, get zero, presumably because they differentiated it. Okay. The question, in, the, in, in a sense, is that uh, what kind of thing always has slope eight? A line, right? So it would have to be 8t. Good. So now these things up here just get copied. Just copy and paste here. Uh, I'll go ahead and cancel the 2 over 2 thingy. Uh, and then minus 8t. And then plus a constant. <laughs> Any questions about this one? OK. So now I need to just make a comment. And that is that uh, if you have a look at what you have uh, written there, and if you wrote something that uh, looks like this, then you need to stop that. <laughs> okay, that's uh, that's obnoxious. Uh, I can appreciate you, uh, you know, maybe you know, with your friends and buddies and stuff want to write your uh, t's to look like pluses, that's fine. But uh, in a math class, uh, especially in an exercise that has t's in it and pluses, uh, they need to look different. Okay. The last thing you want to do is confuse the grader uh, because, you know, they're uh, poor, overworked graduate students and also they're human beings, right? You, you, know, you, don't, want them to, you don't want them to, you know, like, they, we tell them to be objective, right? And, and they're pretty objective. But, uh, you know, if they've been grading for five hours and uh, haven't had any coffee and it's late and then they see this, it might not be good. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, now, to, to, to prime you for, for something that's coming in about 10 minutes, uh, I want to ask you, remind you again, that uh, we went over the power rule. And when, uh, when you're differentiating the, when you're differentiating, the forbidden exponent is uh, n equals zero. The rule doesn't apply for that. And when you're anti-differentiating, which n do we not, is, is forbidden? Negative one, right? Negative one. Uh, it doesn't work for that one. Okay. So now I'm gonna just set that aside and uh, ignore that for a second. Or, or so it may seem. And I'm going to talk about logarithms. Uh, specifically, I'd like for you to uh, recall <coughs> that uh, the derivative of the natural log of x is what? 1 over x. One over x. And uh, Last week, uh, we, we, uh, we covered the chain rule. So the chain rule is what happens when you're differentiating with respect to x, a function, and uh, the input to that function is not x, but is u. That is to say that uh, here, the symbols, uh, input symbol x agrees with the differentiation symbol, so the rule is kind of uh, easy. But uh, when the input symbol is u, and that's not in agreement with x, then the action of the chain rule becomes apparent. And uh, in this case, it will look like 1 over u, and then what? Multiplied by du dx. So that's what the chain rule does. OK. So what is the derivative of the natural log of 2x? Okay, so it'll be 1 over 2x. 
So notice uh, that 2x is not the same as just x. Right? So what we're saying is that, uh, yeah, an x is being input, but before we give it to the logarithm machine, we're messing around with it. We're going to multiply it by 2. So uh, we do something with the x before it gets to the logarithm. And uh, that doing something with the x before it gets to the logarithm, that's, well, in a math sense, that's composing two functions. M the function which multiplies its argument by 2 comes first. And then uh, that the output of that gets, uh, is given to the logarithm. OK, so then to satisfy the chain rule, then, uh, then we multiply by the derivative of 2x. And uh, what's the derivative of 2x with respect to x? 2. Uh, so this would be uh, 1 over x, uh, sorry, 1 over 2x, and then multiplied by 2, which is uh, 1 over x. Now, wait a second. That doesn't seem right. I thought the derivative of logarithm of x was 1 over x. And uh, you're telling me that uh, you're telling me that the derivative of logarithm of 2x is also 1 over x? Let's try that again. What about, uh, what's the derivative with respect to x of something like uh, the natural log of, say, negative 8 multiplied by x? Let's try that again. So the chain rule is saying that it should look like 1 over u multiplied by du dx. So it'll be 1 over negative 8x, and then multiplied by the derivative with respect to x of negative 8x. Now what's the derivative with respect to x of negative 8x? Negative. negative 8. OK, good. So this is going to be uh, 1 over negative 8x multiplied by negative 8. Good. So now we can cancel the negative 8s and get 1 over x. No, that couldn't be right. <laughs> it couldn't be right. <laughs> no, it is right. Uh, it is right, uh, but uh, I hope that you're feeling just a little bit startled that this should occur. Okay. So now I want to... So on the one hand, uh, the chain rule uh, is a sufficient explanation for why it must occur, is that uh, the chain rule is what's causing that uh, 2 and that negative 8 to cancel. In fact, uh, there's nothing special about 2 and negative 8. It would work, in fact, for any constant that's not 0. So it would work for 1326. It would work for negative 2018. Uh, anything at all that's not 0. All right. So I want to convince you that uh, there is yet another uh, reason why this should work. And this is uh, something you've got to remember from uh, college algebra. And, and it, it is this. From college algebra, uh, you learned uh, that logarithms have nice properties. So for example, the logarithm of a multiplied by b. So that's saying you have two numbers, a and b. The first thing you do is you multiply them together. And then after you've multiplied them together, you give them to the log. There's a rule that says that uh, actually, you can compute the log of each one of those numbers separately. So we'll just compute the log of A by itself, and we'll compute the log of B by itself, and then we can do what to get the answer? We add them. So there's a rule that says that, uh, well, if you wanted to multiply first and then compute log, you could do that. or you can, compute, you can compute the logarithm of each individual one and then add them. Uh, this uh, is still important today for mostly theoretical and design reasons, but uh, this used to be very uh, extremely important for practical day-to-day -day reasons uh, because it was, you know, before, before pocket calculators existed, like this one. Uh, this kind of calculator kind of made the day-to-day -day use of this go away, but uh, it used to have day-to-day -day use with something called a slide rule, where it's like, uh, if you ever, you ought, you ought to look one up if you haven't ever. I think the library has one. I have one in my office. Uh, you take this thing, it's like a, it's a ruler, and you literally slide things apart, and uh, you can use it to multiply numbers quickly. 
Uh, in fact, uh, if you ever watched the movie Apollo 13, you know, about, uh, about uh, uh, American astronauts nearly dying <laughs> because their spacecraft exploded in space, <laughs> that's too exciting. Uh, lots and lots of engineers, okay, literally using slide rules as fast as they can to keep these people alive using this rule. Uh, another rule is that uh, if you have two numbers A and B and you divide them and then compute logarithm, uh, instead of, uh, you know, if product becomes, if multiply becomes add, then divide becomes what? Subtract. And again, the reason why this was relevant at that time is that, well, it's just easier to add two numbers than it is to multiply them. It just takes less time. <clears throat> uh, the last rule is this one, is that uh, if you have two numbers and you want to compute a to exponent b and then compute logarithm, then you can, do, you can actually do something else. Do what? Uh-huh and then multiply by the logarithm of A. So, uh, in a sense, what logarithm is doing is it's, uh, you could think of it like it's trading one operation for another. Uh, this rule is saying that uh, it's possible to trade back and forth between multiply and add. It's possible to trade back and forth between divide and subtract. It's possible to trade back and forth between caret exponent uh, and multiply. And uh, generally speaking, as far as computation is concerned, the ones on the right are easier to do than uh, by hand than the ones on the left. <clears throat> okay. So that being the case, uh, can you tell me uh, a different way we can write the natural log of, say, Three multiplied by x. Right, the, the natural log of 3 plus the natural log of x. Now, <clears throat> I have a question. Is 3 a constant? Yeah, <laughs> right? Uh, it is. 3 is 3. So uh, what about the natural log of 3? Is that a constant? Less buy-in on that one. <laughs> We're pretty sure that 3 is constant. Uh, but what about the natural log of 3? Okay, so uh, natural log 3. That's how I get my calculator to do it. So let's go through the following thought experiment. Uh, here I'm about to ask it what natural log 3 is. Suppose I, you know, I ask uh, 1.09 what have you. Okay, and then let's say that uh, I do this here and now and write it down in the notes. 1.09, uh, 86, whatever. And then two days from now, I'll, I'll ask my calculator again. What's it going to say? It's going to say that, right? What if I ask it a month from now? It's going to say that. Okay, now, uh, when you hear a constant, it, it may be the case that... Uh, the only thing that seems reasonable is something like uh, 8. No dispute, 8 is a constant. But because, uh, because logarithm is a function, that also means that logarithm of 8 is a constant. It's a constant. As a result, the derivative of the logarithm of 3 multiplied by x is the same as the derivative of the logarithm of 3 plus the logarithm of x, which means that uh, we can use the sum rule, right? What's the, what's the derivative of logarithm of x? 1 over x. What's the derivative of the logarithm of 3? 0. Why? It's a constant. Logarithm of 3 is a constant. So this is, if you like, 0 plus 1 over x. 
So that's another way to see why, yeah, in fact, the derivative of the logarithm of 2x is 1 over x. And that would have worked for any non-zero constant whatsoever. OK, good. Any question about this? So now we need another thing. <laughs> because uh, in the end, what's going to happen is that uh, I have to show you that uh, this rule that, uh, that you learned from calculus in Calculus 1 is uh, correct, but uh, it's not the complete story. There's actually, there's actually something else. Uh, so this uh, is, is uh, correct as far as it goes, but there's something a little more to it. And we need that little more so that uh, we can have the correct antiderivative rule. All right. Uh, so I want to remind you yet another thing from college algebra. Uh, the definition of the absolute value of x. Well, uh, absolute value of x is a piecewise defined function. It has two clauses, which is to say it's two lines. Uh, the absolute value of x does, um, does uh, one of two different things. It uh, either gives you exactly the x that you put in. So for example, what's the absolute value of 13? 13, right? You put in 13, out came 13. Uh, or, so the, the, it gives you exactly the x back if the x you put in is greater than or equal to 0. The other possibility is that, uh, is that uh, it might negate your, your input. So like, what's the absolute value of negative 26? 26. But uh, to, just to be confusing and complicated, I'm going to say that the absolute value of negative 26 is negative negative 26, right? Because negating the negative number makes it positive. So now, uh, what I want you to observe is that uh, this clause, what this clause does is it's saying, well, I'll negate your input. I'll multiply it by negative 1. And uh, this clause is saying, I'll just give it right back. But I'm going to just slightly modify it to an equivalent representation. I'm going to do that. This wrote multiply by 1. So what I want you to see is that uh, the thing that absolute value does, it does one of two things with your input. You give it an input, and it either multiplies that input by 1, which is to say it does nothing, or it multiplies that input by negative 1. Those are the two things that absolute value does. But uh, in all cases, it multiplies it by some constant, either 1 or negative 1, as a result. The derivative of the log of the absolute value of x is what? <laughs> It's 1 over x. Because if the x that you're dealing with is uh, a positive x, then that means we'd be in this clause. And the derivative of the logarithm of 1x is 1 over x. And uh, if the x we were dealing with was negative, then we'd be using this clause. And we'd be differentiating something that looks like the logarithm of negative 1 multiplied by x. But that's just a constant, and it would go away, and you'd get 1 over x. So the answer is 1 over x. So, so all of this is uh, to say that uh, this is the rule you learned in, in uh, Calculus 1. And it's correct as far as it goes. But it's not the complete story. Uh, this is more nearly the complete story. Is that, uh, in fact, you can do even better and say that uh, we can tell you what the derivative of the composition of these two functions is, where uh, absolute value is the inner function and logarithm is the outer one, as a result. We can say that uh, the antiderivative of 1 over x dx is what? Very good. The natural log 
of the absolute value of x. What's a constant? So now, uh, I'm aware that uh, even now we're still reviewing for some of you, but uh, we're starting to, for some of you, we're starting to get to new things. Uh, for those of you who this is still review, uh, I'll, I'll mention, just mention that uh, if you made it this far, then this was the rule that, that uh, they said for antiderivatives. They must have, otherwise they were just making an error. But uh, if they didn't walk you through this to get you to right here, then uh, I'm sorry. They should have. <laughs> because uh, otherwise it seems too surprising to... Uh, too surprising to, to, to connect these two, that one, the one that you learned in Calculus 1, and uh, this one that does have absolute value. Uh, the reason why it has absolute value, these are the reasons. Good. Any question about this? Okay, let's do another. Let's, uh, let's do uh, something with it. Uh, how about... Uh, the uh, antiderivative of, uh, how about, uh, I don't know, uh, w, uh, let's put a 6 in front of it, so 6w to uh, 8 uh, minus 12 uh, times w to uh, 16, and then over, I don't know, 5w to 9 dw. So really, this uh, exercise is just a, a variation on a theme l l like we already saw uh, half an hour ago or something like that, uh, except I've arranged matters so that logarithm will show up. So please have a go. Okay, so what's the first order of business? Algebra, right? We need to, we need to algebraically prepare this, right? All right. So then, uh, well, I can see that it's similar to the uh, uh, a previous exercise. Uh, we need to separate this into individual terms. So then, something like uh, six over five and then multiplied by, well, uh, if I, well, I'll do it like this, w to 8 over w to 9, and then minus uh, 12 w to 16 over 5 uh, w to 9 dw. 
then uh, this will be antiderivative of 6 over 5. And then uh, the exponent would be w to negative 1 minus 12 over 5 uh, times uh, w to 7 dw. All right. So now, here's the thing. Ten minutes ago, I said I was going to prime you for something. And I said, uh, you remember we were talking about the power rule? And uh, one of the exponents was uh, not permissible. Negative one is not permissible. It's not permissible because, uh, uh, well, if n is negative one and you want to divide, uh, you want to, you would want to divide by n plus one, but n plus negative one, ne negative one plus one would be zero. So can you see that uh, for, for this, for this uh, one, it's not permissible. You can't use the power rule for it. Uh, but you can use what? Logarithm rule. So what I want to stress, I guess, is that, um, is that uh, well, it's sort of like we can do, we can, can anti-differentiate w to any exponent n whatsoever. Almost all of them use the power rule, except, except when n is negative 1, in that case, use the log rule. So we can do all of them. Log is kind of weird, like that, sort of this one-off thing. OK. <clears throat> so uh, I'll rewrite that just slightly so you can see it, like so. Oops. Okay, so now uh, those constants in front, uh, those just, they just hang out from the homogeneity rule. So this would be uh, 6 over 5 multiplied by what for this one? Not quite, almost. Log of what? Absolute value of W. Absolute value. Uh, then minus... <coughs> 12 over 5 just hangs out from the homogeneity rule. And then uh, what? Over 8 plus a constant. Any question about this one? OK, so I have uh, one more of this uh, ilk. So then uh, how about antiderivative of, say, um, I don't know, uh, 8 over uh, z uh, plus, uh, I don't know, like uh, 9 multiplied by uh, z cubed over z to 5, something like that, dz. So now, to get you kind of started, uh, I'll just point out that you need to do a little bit of algebraic simplifying. So I'm going to do that now. <clears throat> so to, to help your eyes a little bit, I'm going to rewrite 8 over z as 8 multiplied by <coughs> 1 over z, like that. And uh, I'm going to rewrite this one uh, as 9 multiplied by, I'll simplify that to 1 over z squared, and uh, please everybody quietly work to the end. Uh, I simplified it, z cubed over z oh, times z.
Okay, now, for those of you who are coming to the end, I'm going to say that uh, I've purposefully uh, done something devious. Maybe, maybe I trapped you, maybe I didn't. So now I'm gonna I'm gonna write the wrong answer. Uh, this is the wrong answer that uh, uh, that that, that uh, comes up quite often. So as for this first term, uh, that eight uh, because of the homoge homogeneity rule, it just hangs out. And then I see one over z, so that'll be uh, natural log of the absolute value of z. Then. The 9, because of the homogeneity rule, just hangs out. So 9, and then 1 over z squared. Surely that's a natural log of the absolute value of z squared. And then plus a constant. So this is not right. But wait, why is it not right? Very good. So, uh, here, yeah, here's the thing: is that uh, this one, uh, if you if you you know sort of put this in the nice calculus format, you know what I mean. Uh, what I mean is, uh, several pages ago, you know, we did we, we we said this, you know, that uh, here's the ones that are nice for algebra, here's the ones that are nice for calculus. For the purposes of calculus, uh, it's better to have fractional and/or negative exponents. Uh, for the purposes of calculus. Now, uh, for that term right there, uh, what is z's exponent if you were to put it in calculus format? z to negative 1. Uh, as a result, for this term, uh, we need to use a logarithm rule. Whereas, uh, if you were to take this one, this uh, term, and represent it in the nice calculus representation. What is z's exponent for that one? z to negative 2. As a result, uh, it's not permissible to use the log rule. You must use the power rule. Okay, but uh, what I find is that uh, if it ever comes to pass that uh, on the page, student sees something that looks like 1 over z squared, especially in an exercise where there was a 1 over z, then there's a high probability that there's going to be a mismatch, and uh, they'll use logarithm for this one. Okay, so I'm just pointing that out here and now when there's no points at stake. So this one would have been okay. This one is not okay. Uh, the reason why I'll just write down those things that we just said. So uh, you know, writing those in calculus form, it would be eight multiplied by z to negative one plus nine multiplied by z to negative two dz. Negative one is the only case in which you use logarithm. In that case, you use the power rule. So this would be 8 uh, multiplied by logarithm of absolute value of z, uh, then plus 9 multiplied by z to exponent to negative 1, divide by negative 1, plus a constant. Any question about this one? Okay, so now, every time uh, in a math class that you talk about logarithm, uh, it is always either immediately preceded or succeeded by what? A discussion of what other thing that always goes with logarithm? Exponential, right? They always, uh, they always, you know, it depends on the instructor and the textbook and a few other minor details, which one comes first. Uh, it so happens that we talked about logarithm first. Uh, but they always come in pairs. 
The reason why they always come in pairs is because just like the squaring machine, the squaring function and the square root function are undoers of each other, they're inverses of each other, and just like derivative and antiderivative are undoers of each other, logarithm and exponential, they undo each other. Which is to say, <coughs> which is to say that uh, if, you, if you take an x and uh, you give it to the logarithm machine and out comes the logarithm of x and uh, you wire up that output as the input to the exponential machine then what comes out the other side? X does. <laughs> That's altogether a complicated way to say take that X and do nothing. First I want you to do that and after you've done doing that, uh, I want you to undo that <laughs> and give me that X back. And uh, you can put those machines together in, in either order, it doesn't matter. Uh, it'll be X on both sides. Okay. So, uh, for example, for example, uh, if you were to take uh, a 2 and compute logarithm of it first, uh, so that uh, you have logarithm of 2, and uh, if you follow that up by uh, computing exponential of it, you take two, compute the logarithm of, the logarithm of that, and then you follow that up uh, by computing the exponential of the result, what do you get? Two. <laughs> and uh, if that seems too good to be true, uh, on my calculator, uh, the way that uh, we compute uh, exponential base e uh, on, my, on my calculator. I have a button that looks like this, e caret, uh, then uh, this. So I'm going to type this into the machine, just, to, just in case there's any doubt of what I'm talking about here. So there it is. If the universe is just, it should give me a 2. Oh, there it is. Right? OK. So and uh, we could do it in the other order just as well. All right. Uh, that being said now, the derivative with respect to x of the exponential, the natural exponential of x, is what? e to x. So uh, now, because of the homogeneity rule, we could, we could insert a, like a 7 in there, so that uh, the derivative of 7 multiplied by e to x is also 7 multiplied by e to x. So uh, besides those uh, homogeneity issues, like multi, multi, uh, putting a, inserting a 7 or a negative 8 or whatever, what have you, uh, the exponential, the natural exponential, is the only function which is its own derivative. Uh, more, more or less, except for that homogeneity issue. You can get rid of the homogeneity issue by saying, I want a function that is its own derivative, and furthermore, I want uh, its derivative at input 0 to be 1. That's enough to uniquely specify the exponential function. In fact, uh, in other contexts, that is the definition of the exponential function. It's the solution to the differential equation uh, that it's own, it, it is its own derivative, and uh, its uh, slope of tangent at input 0 is 1. Uh, fine. So then for the chain rule, if we want to compute the derivative of the exponential where the input symbol is u instead of x, so that these are not in agreement. right? So this is the rule when the input symbol and the differentiation symbol agree. They're both x. Uh, when they don't agree, when the input symbol is u and the differentiation symbol is x, then what's the derivative? e to u. Very good. Multiply by du dx. Okay. So this is information that you knew from calculus one. Uh, 
and remember, what we're doing is we're, uh, we need, we're, we're familiarizing ourselves with the derivative rule so that uh, we can do the antiderivative rule. Uh, the derivative, uh, how about of, say, exponential of 5x would be what? Okay, e to 5x. Is this it? Times five, right? Because here's the thing. Uh, have a look at these. Uh, is the input to the exponential the same as the differentiation symbol? It's not, right? If this is 5x, but the differentiation symbol is just x. So what we're saying is that uh, before it gets to the exponential, we're messing around with it. We're multiplying it by five. Uh, and so uh, that messing around with it uh, shows up with the chain rule. Uh, so we get exponential of 5x and then multiply by 5. That's du dx, the 5. And, and again, I know that uh, some of you want to write that 5 in the front, and uh, by all means. But I'll just remind you that uh, in the first place, I'm always going to write it on the right, just so for, for, for two main reasons. One reason is that... Uh, uh, I, I choose to always write it on the right, so it's always the same. So I'm always doing the same thing, because I'm a teacher. And repetition, the f besides being correct when you're trying to teach, the first most important thing is, is, is repetition. The second most important thing is uh, repetition. And the third most important thing is repetition. <laughs> so so uh, I'll always write it on the right for the repetition reasons. But uh, the other reason is that if you go far enough in math, so like uh, the functions that uh, we're dealing with, their inputs are scalars, like numbers, regular old numbers. But uh, if you want to make their, the inputs something more exotic, like a vector or, you know, whatever, some other things, uh, then uh, in order for the, res the chain rule to be correct in that case, uh, the chain rule has to act on the right. So, It'll be, it'll only, in those cases, it'll only be correct if it is on the right. Uh, fine. So how about, how about, in that case, what's the derivative of, um, say, uh, 2 to x? Because uh, here's the thing, like uh, e to x in, in like science context, like in a physics class or chemistry or something like that, uh, usually it's called like the natural exponential. But uh, to, in a, to, to a mathematician, uh, like I'm trying to say natural exponential, but most of the time I'm just saying exponential. Uh, because in my head, that's what it is, like with a capital V, V exponential. And uh, to, in, to, 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 in the sense that there, there's not really any others than that one. <laughs> uh, so this is, uh, you might say, an unnatural exponential, whatever that might mean. So what's the derivative of 2 to x? Hmm. It's not clear. Right? It's not going to be 2 to x. If that 2 were an e, then, uh, then, it, then it would be. But, uh, OK. So how are we going to deal with this? Hmm. Well, uh, in the first place, uh, I'd like to remind you of some algebraic uh, considerations. And that is that, uh, well, if you have w to exponent m to exponent n, uh, this is called iterated exponents. And uh, you, can, you can say that this is w raised to a single exponent. What single exponent? Not m plus n. m times n m multiplied by n. The one that uh, you were thinking about is this one, w to exponent m multiplied by w to exponent n. This is when you add them. OK, uh, fine. Also, like we said above, uh, 2 can be written in the following kind of funny way, is that uh, you take any, any two machines that uh, undo each other, 
and then you can you can follow one by the other with with initial input two. So like you could take two, square it, and then square root. That's one way to write two. You could take two and you could multiply it by five and then divide by five. That's another way to write two. And what I'm saying is that uh, well, what we're going to do is we're going to logarithm it first, and then after that we're going to compute its exponential. That's another way to write two. Kind of a weird way to write two. So, what I'm telling you is that uh, we could say that the derivative with respect to x of 2 to x is the derivative with respect to x, and then now I'm going to just put some square parentheses here, and then an x. And the thing is, is that uh, I just have to write something in those square parentheses that's equal to 2, and it'll, I'll, it'll be right. So like I could write like 1 plus 1, and that'd be fine. I could write 1.9 plus 0 0.1 in those square parentheses. Anything at all that's equal to 2. What am I going to write? I'll write that one. I'm going to write that one because, uh, well, now we have iterated exponents, right? We have, we have natural exponential of the logarithm of 2 and all that raised to exponent x. So what can we do with those two exponents? We can multiply them together. So this will be uh, the derivative of uh, exponential. Again, so far in this block here, no calculus has occurred. We're just uh, fiddling around with algebra. Uh, so then now it looks like this, exponential of logarithm 2 multiplied by x, like so. And now here's the thing. Now, can we agree that 2 is a constant? How about the logarithm of 2? Also constant, right? So, uh, well... If the derivative of exponential of 5x is exponential 5x times 5, then if I change that 5 to an 8, then the derivative of exponential of 8x would be exponential of 8x times 8. There's nothing, there's nothing sacred about 5 or 8. The only thing that we're using is the fact that it's a constant. So even if I change it to like a weird thing like logarithm of 2, which is still a constant, it'll all still work. So what is the derivative? e to log 2, multiply x, and then what? Two. Yeah, times log 2. What happens to your x? Oh, I see. It's a constant. It's a constant. Okay, now, here's the thing, is that, uh, you know, from, from here to here, this thing uh, above my index finger, that's just a weird way to write uh, 2 to x, and so is that one, right? This is 2 to x, that's 2 to x, that's 2 to x, which means that's 2 to x, just that, that, that bit. So I'm going to replace that with 2 to x, because that's what it is. And that's the derivative of uh, exponential base 2 of x. The derivative of 2 to x is 2 to x multiplied by the logarithm of 2. Because this thing is that thing. Is the same as this thing, is the same as this thing, is the same as that thing. 
all the red underlined things are the same. Some of them happen to be inside of a derivative, but uh, there you have it. So now, the only thing uh, that was that we ended up using about two to, to illustrate that uh, two is not special here is uh, that we used uh, that um, two was a constant. So how about uh, what's the derivative with respect to x of like, uh, you know, 1326 to exponent x? Yeah. Because in the end, the only thing that uh, we used was the, uh, the fact that it's constant. So what I'm, what I'm telling you is that, uh, in fact, there's uh, two rules here at play, and kind of like three rules, is that uh, we have this rule, that uh, the derivative of the exponential of x, the natural exponential of x, that's the good old one. Right? The one that uh, you can just, just write down so easy, like this, e to x. Uh, if we make a minor modification to it and we say, okay, I'm going to do the derivative of the exponential, and then I'm going to put a constant here, kx, like that, then that's a fairly straightforward application of the chain rule. So this will be e to kx. And then what? K. Times k, where k is a constant. Then the one that we just did is that uh, the derivative with respect to x of exponential base a. So now we have a base that's uh, not the natural base. Uh, Re recall that uh, the requirements of a base is that they have to be positive and not one. So like uh, it makes sense to talk about two to x and 10 to x and half to x, but it doesn't make any sense to talk about one to x. It's not, it doesn't make sense to call it an exponential. Uh, similarly, you can't talk about negative three as a base to x. That doesn't make any sense either. So what's the rule here? A to x times the natural log of A. Now, to convince you, uh, maybe to, to, to give just a little more weight to it, is that, uh, well, we're saying that this formula should be true for any A that's positive and not 1. Now, here's the thing. What's the natural number, approximately? About 2.71828, yeah, the natural number, E, yeah. 2.7, 1828, 1828, 45, 90, 45. That's as far as I know it. It goes on forever, but uh, that's all I know. So it's about 2.7, which is positive and not 1, right? So we ought to be able to plug in E and uh, A equal E in this formula. Is it, is it, will it still work? Uh, the derivative of e to x, according to that formula, should be e to uh, x multiplied by the logarithm of e. Is that right? Why? Right. Because the logarithm of e is 1. So in a sense, it's kind of always been there. Uh, but uh, you just didn't see it. Alternatively, you could think of it like this. Is that uh, if you so desired to work uh, your calculus problem in base 2, so that you were dealing with 2 to x, then uh, the universe is going to punish you <laughs> uh, for, for not uh, working in the natural base. You know, because uh, if you're working in base 2, exponential base 2, then logarithm, base, logarithm of 2 is going to show up everywhere. Every time you do a calculus step, another logarithm 2. That's the universe dinging you, saying, hey, what did I tell you about that, what did I tell you about that uh, natural base? <laughs> you need to use the natural base. Uh, you know, when you uh, are doing calculus steps in the natural base, they just, uh, that, uh, that problem vanishes. 
Uh, this shows up all the time, like in, uh, in physical sciences. Uh, because, for example, um, you know, uh, essentially all human cultures count in base 10. Which is an interesting fact, because if you look at history, recent history, you know, this week, hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, uh, it's basically uh, just full of us uh, humans slaughtering each other, honestly, and uh, it's pretty awful. But, uh, you know, we can't agree on any, hardly anything, but uh, we uh, all appear to agree on counting the base 10. And why, <laughs> why is that, that we can all agree on counting the base 10? It's because of a very simple and mundane reason. We have 10 fingers. Yeah, that, that's about it. And uh, here's the thing. Uh, if it had come to pass that uh, we had eight fingers instead, then uh, I'd be willing to bet my life that uh, we'd be counting in base eight. We wouldn't had, uh, we, it wouldn't come to pass that we had nine fingers uh, because uh, it's extremely unlikely for uh, creatures to not have bilateral symmetry. So the number of digits that we have surely has got to be even. So if not 10, then 8, maybe 12. OK, so, <clears throat> so we count in base 10. Uh, and then you know, we make computers, and they count in base, not, not base 10, actually. What do they count in? Base 2. Uh, in some cases, it's convenient to interpret it sometimes in base 16. Uh, or, or base 8, but uh, in the end it counts, they count in base 2, and the reason is because a single transistor uh, has two states, the low voltage state and the high voltage state, the low voltage state being, in, being uh, interpreted as 0, and the high voltage state being interpreted as 1. So they count in base 2. Uh, you know, and in, like in physics and stuff, uh, in physics, uh, they're usually interested in half-life, you know, like uh, you know, how long will this material last? Uh, as a result, all the formulas related to half-life have these logarithm-based, logarithm, log of two factors showing up everywhere. You know, when you're doing like, you know, how long will the, how long will this much uh, uranium last? Well, there's a formula for that, and it, and it has the logarithm of two in it. <laughs> or if you're dealing with pH, the logarithm-based, logarithm of 10, <laughs> if you're doing calculus, uh, will show up. And that's all the, the, the that's the math universe uh, penalizing the chemists <laughs> for counting in base 10 and base 2. Uh, fine. Okay. Uh, good. As a result, uh, for antiderivatives, uh, we have the easiest conceivable one, that is uh, this one, the antiderivative of e to x dx is what? Well, it's e to x plus a constant. Right? That corresponds to this rule. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just, uh, in a sense, I'm just taking this d dx and I'm moving it to the other side. Just, that's this rule. Uh, so now, what if uh, we make it uh, slightly more entertaining and I say the antiderivative of the exponential of like um, 3x? dx. So now, now I inserted that constant. So that's that's going to be this rule, right? So now this rule is saying that uh, if you're differentiating, then uh, the effect of that constant is to come out and multiply. Uh, so if we're doing the opposite of that, then instead of coming out and multiplying, it's going to what? Divide. It's going to divide. So in this case, it'll be uh, one third exponential of three x plus a constant. Okay. How about uh, what's the uh, what's going to be the rule for the uh, antiderivative of say um, 5 to exponent x dx. So that's going to be this rule. It's 
So are, are we operating in the natural base? No, we're operating in base five. Right? So the universe is going to say, you know, don't do that. <laughs> uh, so what's the, you know, the, the, the penalty for differentiating in a non-natural base is that uh, you've got to uh, multiply by the logarithm of the base. Multiply by the logarithm of the base. Uh, so if you're anti-differentiating, then what do you have to do? Divide by the logarithm of, of the base. So it'll be, uh, you know, 5 to exponent x divided by the log of 5, plus a constant. Okay, so now uh, uh, I got a question. Um, here's, here's one. Uh, Antiderivative of x to 2 dx. Now, what's this one? Okay, good. x to 3 over 3. And what, uh, what rule did you uh, use for that? Power rule. Okay, so now, now, so, th so this is right, so this one is correct. Now I'm going to do another one, but uh, it's going to be wrong. And uh, what, I want, uh, what I want you to see is uh, visually how similar these are. So sort of like syntactically, all that's occurred is we switched the positions of 2 and x. Okay. Uh, now, I'm going to give the wrong answer now. 2 to x plus 1 over x plus 1 plus a constant. Okay, now this is not right, but uh, could someone please speculate what uh, what sort of uh, uh, what sort of mistakenness might have occurred in, in the head of someone who did this? Yeah, that's how it appears to me. It appears to me that uh, student uh, well, in the first place, uh, this is an exponential function, two to exponent x. Uh, so, okay. Then uh, now if we suspend that for a moment and say, I'm just looking at things positionally, it appears to me that student appeared to use the power rule. Okay, but uh, power rule only applies to polynomials. It doesn't apply to, uh, to exponential functions, which is to say that uh, the, correct, the correct application, the, uh, the correct use is this, that uh, if you find yourself doing this, then you're, you're anti-differentiating uh, an exponential function in base 2. So uh, that's, that's this kind of rule. So it will look like 2 to x, and then now divided by the logarithm of base 2, and then plus a constant. Now, uh, to sort of make it as clear as possible, or as clear as I can, uh, I would like for you to see that this one, this, this thing right here, it's a polynomial in the first place, uh, and it has the sort of the shape, the form of variable caret constant, right? A variable base, a constant exponent. Whereas uh, this one is exponential because uh, syntactically it is a constant uh, base raised to a variable exponent. And even though they look uh, visually similar, uh, their, their mathematical behavior uh, is, is not similar. Any questions about this one? So this one is, uh, this one's just wrong down here. Any question? So that sort of, you know, if you can see that, uh, well, we've got variable and constant, and we can, you know, 
syntactically move their positions around. You might wonder, well, what if we, uh, what if we change it? What if it's like constant raised to a constant? So like, uh, what is uh, the antiderivative of something like uh, 5 to, uh, I don't know, like 37 uh, dt? Yeah, right? Because, uh, well, isn't it the case that 5 to 37 is a constant? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's a constant. It's kind of a weird looking constant. It's a really big constant too, by the way. <laughs> it's a big number. Uh, but uh, it's just a constant. Uh, then you might ask, well, what if it's like variable to variable, right? What if you wanted to anti-differentiate x to x. Uh, in that case, the answer is that uh, it's not possible. You can't do it. Uh, we can't really discuss exactly why you can't. And by can't, I don't mean like, I know how, but I'm not going to tell you. Or, I know how, but uh, you're never going to know how because you're never going to get far enough. Nothing like that. I mean, I mean that uh, it can't be done. Like, uh, it, took, it, it took some serious mathematicians back in the day to figure out, oh, Actually, that uh, cannot be done. Wow. OK. That being said, uh, would you please consider something like, uh, say, 5x to 10 uh, plus x to x minus, uh, say, 8 over x uh, plus uh, 6 uh, minus x to x, like that, dx. So, like, uh, that's kind of interesting, right? I kind of, it's, it sort of sounded like I said uh, that it's literally not possible to anti-differentiate x to x. And then I, like, gave you one, an exercise with that in it. Nevertheless, I claim that uh, it's within your skill to do this exercise. So what's the trick then? Sorry? No? Yeah. Yeah, they just cancel. Right? Right? You can't do it. You can't, uh, you can't anti-differentiate x to x. Well, you know, I have to put a little asterisk on that. And that uh, by cannot, I mean... Uh, there is no closed form function uh, that, uh, that is the antiderivative of x to x. But uh, here's the thing, is that uh, plus x to x minus x to x. <laughs> which, which class did you take first? Algebra, <laughs> right? So the purpose of this exercise is just to hit that again uh, to see that, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, they just cancel. Uh, now, that being said, 
uh, you know, if you didn't see it, uh, don't worry, you're not alone. <laughs> Uh, it is, uh, you know, besides, well, let me say it like this. Instructors have to teach, uh, you know, we're, we're supposed to teach y'all, but uh, at the same time, we're also supposed to train TAs. And, uh, you know, they have a graduate, they are, they, they're getting a graduate degree in math. They already have a degree in math, and moreover, they did pretty well. And uh, I'd say about uh, easily two-thirds of graduate students, at least when they meet me the first time, they have a class, you know, they're one of my TAs the first time, they, uh, I stump them with this one. I, not even, uh, e the, what they do is they just see that X to X and they just know, they just, you know, they just think, I know that that's not possible. And then, you know, they, <laughs> they can't uh, move their eyes, you know, eight centimeters over there and see, oh yeah, okay, yeah, subtract. Okay, good. So, uh, this one, 5x to 11 over 11 minus 8 log absolute x. And then what's the antiderivative of 6? 6x plus 6x uh, plus a constant. Any question about this one? <clears throat> what would you consider your answer if they didn't cancel? I wouldn't pose the question. Uh, um, b because it's not uh, answerable. Uh, and if I did pose a question like that, that would be an error. I would just retract the question. <laughs> uh, so last idea, last thing I'm going to leave us with so that uh, you can have something to mull over um, for Thursday. So I'll say let, uh, let f of x be uh, something like 6x uh, plus 5. So uh, the derivative of f is that. Uh, and moreover, uh, the original function evaluated at 8 is, say, something like um, 34. Uh, doesn't matter. So I want you to find f of x. So I gave you the derivative of the function, and uh, I want you to find the original. So now, what if I said that uh, here's a number, and I give you a number, and uh, it's 20. And I say that uh, this is actually twice the number that I'm looking for. What are you going to do? I'm going to divide by 2, right? Uh, and if I, so if I give you something and I say, you know, uh, this is the, I've, I've bananaed this number. But I, I want you to give me the original n number. Then you need to unbanana it, right? So I've given you the derivative of the function that I'm looking for. What do you need to do? Yeah, you need to compute its antiderivative. Okay. So f of x, evidently, is a is the uh, antiderivative of the derivative of, of f. So we're saying that, OK, you differentiated it. I'm going to undo that with the antiderivative. OK, so then I'm against the clock, so I'm going to just do this real quick. So 6x plus 5 dx. Uh, antiderivative of that would be 3x squared plus 5x. And now, because the antiderivative is not unique, all I can do is write plus c. But nevertheless, I, I claim to you that uh, with just a little bit more work, you can, in fact, tell me exactly what that c is. Plug in the 8. Plug in the 8. So you're telling me that if I plug 8 into here, into this f, what should I get? You should get 34. So you'll know that you have the right f the right C, when it is the case that uh, you plug in 8 as input and it produces 34 as output. So now we'll use this and uh, determine that uh, 34 is what we should get when we plug in 8. So that would be 3 multiplied by 8 squared plus 5 multiplied by 8 plus C. So that's uh, job for a calculator.
That's 232. Plus C. So then uh, negative 198 is C. And uh, therefore, the original function is 3 times x squared plus 5x minus 198. That's the original. All right, so I hope you all have a wonderful uh, Tuesday.